Well, blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Seasons, blessings. I, uh, myself, I'm not into Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, but I am into Jesus. I attended a wonderful carol service, and, of course, we've done some other things of a nature of love offerings to missionaries and needy people and things like that that we we do, not to let the right hand know what the left hand is doing, but essentially, I myself, I only celebrate the nativity. I don't... Uh, you know, do the commercial thing. But if somebody does, I don't hold that against them. We're clear in Colossians 2 and Romans 14, but each be fully convinced in his own mind, just do it unto the Lord. And uh, the nativity is a very, very important saga theologically. Uh, we have teachings dealing with it. It'll feature prominently, Lord willing, in my next book, Born in a Manger, Coming on a Cloud, and uh, this is the time. Also, one thing about Christmas I do like, if you want to call it Christmas, is that it does present an opportunity to present the gospel. You can invite unsaved family, friends, neighbors to things like carol services and so forth. People might take a tract who wouldn't otherwise or something of that nature. So if it can be used to present what the nativity is about or who the nativity is about, I'm in favor of, of it. But for me, it's the nativity. It's not Christmas. It is about uh, Jesus, not about Rudolph. Uh, my own reflection is this, um, and I say this, again, not trying to persuade anyone to agree with me. It's just... St. Nicholas was a historical figure. He was a, a leader, senior pastor, bishop, episcopal of the church in Ephesus during the final pagan persecution of Christians in Ephesus. He really did exist. He was known for his ministry to seafarers. Ephesus was a port. Now it's the port area is silted in. It's about a mile inland, but in biblical times and in the early centuries of the church, it was still a port city. And he had a ministry to sailors, but he was known for his love of children and for the poor. And this was Nicholas, Nicholas. And he was, of course, a Greek. That was a Greek area before the Turks invaded it. It was a Greek area. Uh, and he was in prison for his faith. He was persecuted for his faith. He was a man known for Christian charity to the poor. Uh, and his love for children and for, for his ministry to sailors. I have no problem with St. Nicholas. The problem is, in the English-speaking world, St. Nicholas and Santa Claus, or Father Christmas, as he's called in England usually, became conflated. They, they became merged into one character uh, that have nothing to do with each other. In Holland, you celebrate... St. Nicholas Day before Christmas. St. Nicholas, and he comes on a steamboat with his assistant, his friend, a black guy named Pete, and uh, they give gifts to kids and stuff like that. And he comes on a, you know, because St. Nicholas came on a, you know, he had his ministry to seafarers, to sailors. So he comes on a boat instead of on a, a sled or a sleigh with reindeer. He comes on a boat. Um, the, the Dutch tradition uh celebrated in Holland and in, in, in Afrikaans speaking South Africa somewhat is more accurate to the truth. You know what I mean? At least, at least there was a St. Nicholas <laughs> and at least he did espouse the, the virtues and beliefs of Christianity. He was persecuted and he was into charity and children and things like that. Um, I wish they had just kept the way it was, but it was commercialized, and then there was this poem the night before Christmas, and one thing led to another, and then the Coca-Cola company came, and they made the colors of the Coca-Cola bottles, the red and white, the colors of Santa Claus, and it all became something it never originally was. I think I think the Dutch had it right. I, I, I've got no problem with St. Nicholas, but Santa Claus is an imposter. He, he's not the real St. Nicholas. Um, and as Morse Rosen said, he's a communist. He dresses in red and only gives away things other people pay for. And I, I think he had a point. But such is it. I can only speak for myself. Those are my views at this time. Now, in, in the Middle East, in, in Israel, 
and other countries in the Middle East, and in Greece, and in some of the Balkan countries. Uh, Christmas is celebrated the 6th or 7th of, of January. It's not celebrated now. So Christmas is more of a season, more of a season. Uh, so it's still very much Christmas in Israel. Um, for those who celebrate it, for those who observe it. Of course, at this time of year, that time of year, Jesus would have celebrated Hanukkah and John 10, but we've talked about that before. So that's it. In the Middle East, in Israel, we're still in the Christmas season, very much so. And uh, the biblical new year is, of course, the first of Nisan, roughly the beginning of April. Um, the beginning of the spring is the biblical new year. Not January 1st, but such is it. Here we are. Not the Feast of Saturnalia. The 25th of Saturday, of December was Saturnalia. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah on the 25th of the Hebrew month of Kislev. Um, but whatever you do, as Paul writes in Colossians and Romans, do it unto the Lord. We're just going to continue with our normal Bible study. My apologies for being late. I got caught up in something entirely my fault for not keeping an eye on the clock. I get hyper-focused and engrossed, and uh, I hate to begin something and not finish it, if if possible. So I did it. Um, please overlook my uh, transgression. 30th chapter of Exodus. Now, this is a fairly long chapter, and we're going to need to do it probably in two weeks this week and the following week next next thursday moreover in verse one you shall make an altar as a place for burning incense you shall make it of acacia wood again this very very hard wood harder than oak that would be plated with gold okay and we know the altar is always a type of the cross it's where something sacrificial was brought to be sacrificed. It's always a type of the cross. You shall make an altar, not to be confused with the altar, with the steps for the animals. This is for the burning of incense. Moreover, you shall make an altar as a place for burning incense. You shall make it of acacia. Its length shall be a cubit, and it's with a cubit. Perfectly square, it shall be square and its height shall be two cubits. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. That is, it had to be carved into it. And you shall overlay it with pure gold. Its top, its sides, all around, its horns, you shall make a gold molding all around for it. Gold speaks of that which is eternal, non-corrosive. And you shall make two gold rings for it under its moldings. You shall make them on its two side walls, on the opposite sides, and they shall be holders for bowls, for poles, which to carry it. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Now notice, the ark could not be touched. The Levites had to carry it with these poles. Well, so too, the altar of incense could not be touched. It had to be carried by the Levites with these poles. Okay. And these poles would be of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. You shall put this altar in front of the veil that is near the ark of the testimony, on front of the divine presence in the ark, the Aaron Kodesh, uh, on front of the veil, the vilon in front of the temple, uh, in front of the mercy seat. That is the ark of the testimony where I will meet with you. Remember, the mercy seat corresponds to the throne of grace. And Aaron, the high priest, is a type of Christ, as our high priest, according to Hebrews, shall burn fragrant incense on it. And he shall burn it every morning with when he trims the lamps. And when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer any strange incense on this altar or burnt offerings, or meal offerings, and you shall not pour out a libation on it. Let's stop at verse 9 just for a bit. We know from the book of Revelation and from the book of Ezekiel, incense is a biblical figure 
or type of the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. When the angel had the censer in the book of Revelation and threw it to earth, it was the prayer of the saints. Now you think about that. We also see this in the sixth chapter of Revelation, where there's imprecatory prayer, where the martyrs are asking the Lord, how long will it be before you avenge what the forces of Antichrist and the world did to us? Imprecatory prayer. Um, we always talk about grace and forgiveness and things of this nature, and Lord, forgive them. And well, that is true. But for those who reject the gospel and continue in wickedness and continue to hate Christ, there is place in both testaments or seasons in both testaments. You see this repeatedly in the Psalms, but we see it in the book of Revelation for imprecatory prayer. And a time will come when the prayer of the saints will be not simply Maranatha, come Lord, but come and bring judgment on the kingdom of Antichrist. The world will become so evil, so evil, when the Antichrist is unleashed, that the prayer of the saints will become imprecatory. Now, I've talked about this on certain other recorded teachings on RTN, I believe. We see that Jesus said, I wish the fire was already kindled. He was getting so angry, like pulling your hair out angry. He wished the judgment would already come. Well, a time is going to come when that sentiment of Christ will become a reality in our own prayer. Ezekiel and Revelation tell us incense is the prayer of the saints. But now let's just look very briefly at something, a verse in the Song of Solomon, for those who don't know it, I know a lot of our own people do. Turn with me, please, to the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon has multiple aspects. It's almost multi-dimensional. Multi it speaks about Solomon's romance with Shulamit that is representative of Christ's relationship with his bride, the church, but it also speaks a great deal about both his first coming and his second, his passion and crucifixion and, and, and also his return. For instance, in chapter 2, verse 13, the fig tree has ripened its figs. The vines in blossom have given forth their fragrance. Well, we see this in Revelation 6, just before the uh, time of time is coming, where the uh, fig tree will, will shed its figs. Uh, once they, if they're not picked quickly, they fall. And we see this in Revelation. But in chapter 4, verse 6, until the cool of day when the shadows flee away, I will go to the mountain of myrrh. Remember myrrh's anointing for burial. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea bought, bought myrrh to anoint Jesus' corpse mixed with aloes. Also the Magi bought myrrh at the Nativity, or after the Nativity. They bought myrrh because the Messiah was going to die. I'll go, to, before he rose, I'll go to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. The hill of frankincense. Now we extract, and I'm not going to get into the technical linguistics because it involves Latin and Aramaic. Um, we extract the term Calvary from Golgotha. <laughs> okay. Now I'll go to the mountain of myrrh, the hill, hill of frankincense. This is one of the arguments that would say that the place of crucifixion was not actually at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There are other arguments that support it, but geophysically it's not really a mount. It's a higher point in Jerusalem, but not a mount. There were other theories that he died at Gordon's Calvary, which looks like a skull, 
if you know what I'm talking about, near the garden tomb. Others, even the Mount of Olives. Uh, he was crucified on the Mount of Olives. Others say elsewhere. There's theories. But this would seem to indicate it was some kind of a Mount of Myrrh, the Hill of Frankincense, where the bridegroom would go to die for the bride. Well, what incense did Jesus burn as our high priest on the altar? when he went to the mountain of myrrh, the hill of frankincense, what incense did our high priest burn? What was the prayer of Jesus on the cross? Father, forgive. Father, forgive. His sinless son who took our sin, bringing that fragrance that was so sweet to the nostrils of God to use a anthropomorphism, that the father could not turn it down. The father could not say no. It's only for the sake of his son that we do not experience his wrath and judgment. The father could not say no to the son, his sinless son. The incense was just too sweet. Father, forgive. Father, forgive. Hence, when we look at the altar of incense, we have to understand in Exodus 30, that all of this typology of the high priest and of the incense and of the altar foreshadows the passion crucifixion of the son and what he achieved for us in his death and of course in his resurrection but we're speaking mainly of his death okay so we see this a fragrant incense we are to bring fragrant incense to the lord Prayers should not be ritualistic or liturgical. They should be inspired by the Holy Spirit who intercedes, who, who the Holy Spirit who comes into our spirit. We cannot, we can, you can pray in the flesh. You know, people can do that. They, there's churches that just make ritual prayers and they're purely liturgical. They read them from a book or something like this, and that's all it means. Um, but real prayer is a thing of the spirit. There's incense and there's fragrant incense. Prayer that is stirred up in the heart of the believer by the Holy Spirit is a fragrant incense. Not all incense is as sweet as a fragrant incense. When I was a hippie, we used to use incense <laughs> to cover up the marijuana smoke. <laughs> we were burning incense, all right, but it didn't have anything to do with God. It was demonic. I believe psychedelic drugs, even pot, are, are demonic. And now the pot is so strong, it's much stronger than most of the reefer around when I was a kid. It's demonic. Well, you can burn the incense, but that doesn't mean God is in it. I mean, I thought it was. The only religion that appealed to me before I was saved was Rastafarianism because the Jamaicans, the Rastafarians, smoked marijuana sacramentally. Cannabis was a sacrament to them. They, ganja, you know, they, they, would, they had a pipe, a, a bong, a pipe, and they would smoke it, and they would say the king is, we're burning incense in the chalice, the king is in his palace, and they, they saw a spiritual dimension in the cannabis consumption um with the reggae music and all this kind of stuff um again you can burn incense and there are demonic versions of it i, I was into demonic versions of it with, with the psychedelic drugs and we burned the incense you know what i mean but uh not a fragrant incense a fragrant incense is an incense that pleases the lord we have to understand something. There's a verse that tells us even the prayers of non-believers, of the unrighteous, of backsliders, even their prayers are an abomination. I will. Not, there's a verse that says, I will not sniff your fragrances. God says, I will not sniff you. First deal with the sin. First repent. Put things right. Then I will sniff the fragrances. Then the incense will mean something. You see people who are religious hypocrites who live one way 
but they still say perfunctory or ritualistic prayers or liturgical prayers. Um, even their prayers are an abomination. They may be burning incense, but it is not the sweet incense. It is not the sweet fragrance. It is not the fragrant incense that God is looking for. It had to be a certain kind of incense. Okay. And bought before the ark, before the divine presence. Again, when we pray, we're talking to the Lord. Now also notice something. It is sacrificial. It is sacrificial. There is a nice hymn, almost like a song that Christians have always sung, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Well, that is true. That is true. In principle, it's true. It is a privilege. However, there's a sacrificial element in prayer. There is a sacrificial element in prayer. Remember, the flesh and the old nature doesn't want to do it. The flesh and the old nature doesn't want to do it. Or if they do it, they'll do it in a perfunctory manner or a liturgical manner or a religious manner. They'll say grace before meals or something like that, but that's it. You know, they're Sunday morning Christians or something like that. I try to pray constantly throughout the day. I try to, and I usually have short prayer breaks throughout the day. I think most, most sincere Christians do. You know, we're always trying to talk to the Lord and stuff like that. But prayer involves an element of sacrifice. You are burning something on an altar. Okay, You're burning something on an altar. You may be tired. You may be hungry. You may be pressured to do other things. What is the priority going to be? Now, I don't mean if the baby is teething and crying or something like put a guilt trip on somebody for something they have to do. I don't mean a, a Christian medical doctor in a chapel in a hospital at the chapel service and his buzzer goes off and patients has gone into cardiac arrest or something. And he's got it. I'm not talking about that. I'm not, ta I'm not talking about uh, census commonus. But what I am saying is it should be a priority. Even if we have to do it sacrificially at the cost of something else within obviously reason god made babies and god knows babies teeth and they get fevers and they cry <laughs> and god knows about that and, you know god knows about heart attacks you know god knows about things like that but prayer is sacrificial there is a sacrificial element to prayer we don't normally think of it that way we normally think of it from the aspect of <clears throat> What a privilege to carry. Well, that is a truth. That is a it's 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 true in what it says. The hymn is song is true in what it says. But we have to realize there's things that are also true that it doesn't say. There is an element of sacrifice involved in prayer. Jesus would sometimes stay up all night, all night talking to his father. Okay. There are some churches that have things like a night of prayer, half night of prayer, fast days, and things of this nature. I'm hungry. Oh, yeah, but we're praying. This is a fast day. we got a fast day coming up for Hatun Tash. Please consult our website. But let's look. They shall burn a fragrant incense on it. Now notice what happens next. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. As we always say repeatedly, prayer is a two-way conversation. Yes, the Holy Spirit speaks to us. He speaks to our spirit. That is true. But the first and foremost way God speaks to us is through the lamp, through his word. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Simply stated for new believers, when we pray, we talk to the Lord. When we read his word, he talks back to us. 
That's not to say he doesn't speak to us in other ways, but the first and foremost way is through his word, and any other way he speaks to us has to be evaluated in light of Scripture. People can think the Holy Spirit showing them this or God told them that, and it's not scriptural. We've all encountered that, particularly among my fellow charismatics and Pentecostals. The Lord showed me this and God told me that, and they're doing things that are not scriptural. Notice the burning of the incense. The prayer is in tandem with the trimming of the lamp. When Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, at night, he burns incense. There shall be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. It is a good thing to pray when you wake up for sure, but it is a good thing to pray when you go to sleep. Remember in the temple there was the morning and the evening sacrifices. Now again, we have policemen and firefighters and we have nurses and medical doctors and people in the military are on the night shift. They're on duty at midnight or somebody else's day or somebody else's night. Well, the Levitical priests were like that. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. There were priests who worked the night shift. We're not necessarily talking about ungodly hours. <laughs> All hours can be godly. But notice there was the morning and the night. He had to trim the lamp at night. There shall be perpetual incense. Prayer at night. It is good to read a little a, a passage or whatever the Lord leads you from the scripture at night. And it is good to pray before you go to sleep. It is not to demean doing it in the morning <laughs> to begin your day. This is the morning sacrifice and the night sacrifice. But let's not forget that there's the morning and the night. We are told it shall be perpetual. Prayer should be constant. When we're working, when we're eating, when we're playing with the children, when we're doing whatever we're doing, the Lord is always there communicating with us by his spirit. Now, the scripture does tell us, let your words be few. Let your words be few. For God is in heaven, you are on earth. In other words, there's no need to ramble when you're burning the incense. Uh, incense was to be pure. The Holy Spirit may lead you to pray about something. He may lead you to be praying about the government in your country. Paul says he wants prayers and intercessions to be made for those in authority. He might want, want you to be praying for your family or for unsaved relatives. Okay. Oh, Lord, I'd like to pray for that lady I saw today who I gave a track to. You know, the one who had the 1998 Buick, the gray one parked over next to the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Let your words be few. Pure incense is, I wouldn't say abbreviated, but it has brevity. It has brevity. It is not unduly ostentatious. It has brevity. Let your words be few. Pure incense has brevity. You don't ramble on and on and talk to God as if you were talking to someone else. He's in heaven. We are on earth. Let your words be few when the incense is pure. You shall not offer any strange incense on this altar. Now we get serious. Strange fire. I'm going to acquaint you with a Hebrew term. That Hebrew term is avodat zera. Avodat zera. Remember, when the priests burned the strange fire and God smoked them? Avodat Zerah. They were burning incense to the Lord, but it was not as prescribed. We will come to that. When we engage in unbiblical worship, when we engage in unbiblical prayer, it is strange fire, strange fire. We may be offering it to the Lord, 
but it is not what he prescribed. Not what he prescribed at all. It's strange fire. This can bring God's judgment. We, we have the, what happened with the sons of Aaron and so forth. They're burning strange fire. God specifically warned. In other words, when you worship the true God in the wrong way, it's possible to worship the true God in the wrong way. Now, we've explained this on multiple of our recorded teachings. The high places. There was one high place where Yahweh wanted to be worshipped and ordained. It was Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the Temple Mount. Remember the woman at the well? You have this mountain. We have Mount Gedizim. You have another mountain. Before Jesus, of course, went any further in the conversation, he corrected her wrong doctrine. The Samaritans were burning incense to God, or sacrificing to God on the wrong mountain. Whenever you have high places, bima'ot in Hebrew, when you begin worshiping the true God in the wrong way, it'll wind up in idolatry. It'll wind up in idolatry. That's what the Hebrew term avodazera means. It's translated idolatry, but it really means strange service, a strange worship service. I've seen these things. You've seen these sick things promoted by Michael Brown and Guy Chevro, these counterfeit revivals in Toronto and Pensacola. Where I, I, I saw one, you know, they said, oh, the river's going to come, the river's going to come, it's the Holy Spirit. And they were taking Ezekiel 47 out of all contexts. And, 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 and John 7, out of all context, get ready, it's going to come. Don't stand there, you'll be swept away. It's coming at 7 o'clock. The Holy Spirit will be here. The river's going to flood through. And at 7 o'clock, they all begin going like this, like the swimming. It just, and they said it was worship. They were, this is, uh, was the Pensacola. They were sick in the head. Sick in the head. It's strange fire. There was another one where they were pogo sticking in England, and, and and oh my lord, and they were engaging in these Celtic, ancient Celtic worship rituals to the Lord. Youth of the Mission got involved in this in the Pacific region. They were taking things that were associated with the worship of demons, demon idols, like uh was the, the, the volcano god, not this Pele, but the other one, A -E Sandy, what was it? Sandy, uh, uh, is Sandy gone? Sandy was a missionary in the South Pacific. He knows better than I do. Unmute, Sandy. Anyway, I think it was Eo. And they were taking these rituals associated with Eo. Yeah, now, I'm here. What was the, the Hawaiian volcano god? The Polynesian volcano? E e uh, well, it's actually Pele. Pele, Pele, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Pele. Before the missionaries came to Hawaii, and they'll always tell you how the missionaries came and began Dole Pineapple Company and exploited them. What they don't tell you is they were worshiping Pele before the missionaries came, and they were taking newborn babies and throwing them into the volcano to placate Pele. Well, youth of the mission got into this kind of stuff. You can call Jesus Pele, you can call Jesus this, that, the other thing. And the people would be incorporating pagan worship and calling it Christian in the name of trying to uh, contextualize. Now, I'm all in favor of contextualization biblically, like Paul did it. You know what I mean? He would say, I'm going to tell you who the unknown God is. He's not who you think he is. I'm going to tell you that there's a way to contextualize the gospel, for sure, biblically. But when you begin imitating pagan cultures of, of, with, uh, of demonic idolatry, <laughs> well, there are people calling themselves missionaries who do this stuff. Um, this is strange fire. It'll always end in something bad. Roman Catholic nuns in the Middle Ages, and even after the Middle Ages, got a hold of the Song of Solomon. 
saying that they were brides of Christ. Now, the bride of Christ is always corporate, always corporate, right? They said they're brides of Christ, and when they would take their final vows as nuns, they considered it to be their wedding ceremony to Jesus. And they would read the Song of Solomon as erotic literature, as sexually erotic literature. And they would do all this sick stuff. Um, but because the priest was a surrogate Christ, <laughs> that's what they, and the Pope was the Holy Father, and they called the priest father, and, and, the, and the vicar of Christ, and all this kind of, the, the convents would become whorehouses for priests. In Ireland, they found graveyards where the nuns would, the priests would get the nuns pregnant, and they'd kill the babies after they spread place in Ireland to them. They found 900. And this went on for centuries. Well, what, what, why would they read the Song of Solomon out of context in that one? Strange fire. Strange fire. Whenever you get into, just like Baal worship, the, 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 the Canaanites had a Baal, the Hebrews had a Baal. Your husband is your maker, Baal in Hebrew. The Canaanites had a Baal. And their ball rose from the dead every spring. The two became confused. Whenever you burn strange fire, you worship the true God in the wrong way, it'll end in some form of idolatry. It'll always end in some form of idolatry and frequently perversion. And in the case of Roman Catholic Church, infanticide. <laughs> That's what you've got? That's what you've got? Now you got a pope who's saying you can bless you can bless same sex put a benediction on same sex marriages on, on, on the same sex relationships <laughs> on sin. Well, the root of that is strange fire. The root of that is strange fire. Whenever you have idolatry, you're going to have moral perversion, and debauchery will result. The sins of Molech, the baby, the, the, sacrificing the babies to Molech under King Manasseh. <laughs> You're going to go from strange fire to idolatry to some kind of immorality perversion of a gross nature. This happened at Caesarea Philippe, where the, where the Neronium was, where Jesus said that what Peter upon this rock, speaking of himself, of course, not Peter. Well, in the Seleucid period, that is where the priests of Pan worship Pan, and they would try to worship Pan by consecrating these goats to the god Pan. Pan was a Greek god who pretended to be a man, and they would have sex with these goats to worship Pan. Um, the, these priests of Pan, would they would engage in bestiality. There's a whole background to Caesarea Philippe uh, for Matthew 16 and 17, a whole background. We have a teaching, a recorded teaching filmed on site. You can see on the website, I filmed it on location. Um, so you're going to go from strange fire. We'll always come to idolatry. The idolatry will come to some kind of immorality, usually something really perverted. Then it will go from that to debauchery. You just look at it. Look at the Catholic Church. Murdering babies in Ireland and burying them out in back of a convent. Well, what preceded that? Well, moral debauchery. Well, what preceded that? Idolatry. Praying to graven images. Well, what preceded that? Strange fire. It is a very, very slippery slope. It will inevitably, one thing will lead to another. It's no coincidence that you've got these kind of scandals of, of the nature you see them in Hillsong and in IHOP and things like and in Willow Creek what happened with Bickle and these guys and and, and Hybels and the, 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 the Houstons and Carlin. It's not a coincidence. Hillsong was strange fire. So many of the lyrics to, of what they were singing were not scriptural. It is strange fire. 
It is not a soothing aroma to the Lord. It is not a fragrant incense. It's strange fire. Strange fire will result in idolatry. Idolatry will result in immorality. Immorality will eventually come to some kind of out-and-out -out debauchery, even murder, as in the days of King Manasha and the Moloch worship. Well, let's look further now. This goes on. We're resuming from verse 9. You shall not offer any strange incense on the altar or burnt offering or meal offering. You shall not pour out a libation on it. Notice something. Any strange incense on this altar or burnt offering, that's strange, or meal offering, that is strange. You shall not pour out a libation on it. What happened in the days of Elijah with the high places and the priests of Baal? What did Elijah say? Those who eat at Jezebel's table. Remember in Kings? Those who eat at Jezebel's table. The New Testament uses Queen Jezebel as a picture of the seduction of false religion. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Verse 14, I have a few things against you because there are some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit acts of immorality. Christ died and rose. He's no longer on the crucifix. As we've often said, the problem with the crucifix is the wrong person is on it. Christ is risen. He's not crucified. He's been crucified. The person who should be crucified is you and I, our old nature. You want a crucifix? Put a little statue of yourself on it. Crucify the old man, the old woman, the old nature. They got the wrong person on the crucifix. Christ is not on the crucifix. He died once and for all. Now, of course, the Roman Catholic Church denies this and says he has to die again in the Mass and in the Mass. So they make a graven image and they venerate it. They bow down before it. We're not talking about sculptor or religious art here. We're talking about idolatry. They're venerating the image. And they offer up the bread and wine before it, and the priest says, Hoc est corpus meum. This is my body lifted up in front of a crucifix. What is this? eating things sacrificed to idols, and what follows it? Commit acts of immorality. When you have unbiblical worship, you're going to have idolatry. You have idolatry, what is going to follow? Immorality. Let's look to the church of Thyatira, verse 20 of chapter 2 of Revelation. I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel. What does she do? Well, she misleads his servants. She teaches them to commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. This is the Roman Catholic Eucharist. And certain other denominations have their own versions of it. Catechetical Lutheranism very closely borders on it as does Anglo-Catholicism, even more so. Eastern Orthodoxy, also. Lutherans just stop, at least catechetical Lutherans, stop a hair breadth short of it. They say it's consubstantiation instead of transubstantiation. Catholicism? You eat food sacrificed? It's Jezebel. It's spiritual seduction. What did Elijah say in Kings? Those who eat at Jezebel's table. 
Every time you see a Roman Catholic participating in the Mass, they're denying the sufficiency of Calvary that he dies once and for all, as it states in Peter and as it states six times in Hebrews. Once and for all, perfect atonement. Denies, it denies the gospel. Secondly, they engage in idolatry. It is idolatrous. Thirdly, they engage in the sin of cannibalism. They drink his blood. Vampire religion forbidden by Acts 15. If you really believe it's transubstantiated protoplasmic blood under the appearance of wine, why are you drinking it? Now we have other teachings dealing with the demonic nature of the Mass and the Roman Catholic doctrines of Eucharist. But it follows the same pattern. The Lord's Supper gets corrupted. Do this in remembrance of me. Proclaim his death until he comes. It's a Paschal Seder. You look back, Jews look back to the redemption out of Egypt. They look forward to the coming redemption of Messiah. So too, we look back to Calvary and the resurrection, and we look forward to the return of Christ. It's an appetizer as we save the marriage supper of the Lamb. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus would have said something like, Zot asu le zikroni. The Hebrew Aramaic would be very close. Zot asu le zikroni. Do this in remembrance of me. We proclaim his death until he comes. Like the Passover, we look back and look forward. No, it's the same sacrifice as Calvary, happening again sacramentally. It's not a memorial. They're burning strange fire. They wind up eating food sacrificed to idols. Let's go back. Exodus 30, verse 10. Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. He shall make atonement on it with the blood of the sin offering. Of atonement once a year throughout your generations, it is most holy to the Lord. Why the blood? When Jesus burned that incense on the altar, his prayer, the irresistible incense to God, because of his blood, the life was in the blood. It is not just holy, it is most holy. Now here it is a Paschal illusion, it's referring to Passover, Christ would die at Passover. The Lord also spoke to Moses in verse 11. When you take a census of the sons of Israel to number them, then each one of them shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. When you number them, there shall be no plague among them. When you number them. This is what everyone who is numbered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 gerahs. Half a shekel as a contribution to the Lord. Now, this, of course, connects with the half shekel of silver for the firstborn, Jesus being the firstborn of the Father. Not simply chronologically, he's the only begotten of the Father, but his prominence, his position. He was betrayed for silver. Remember, silver in biblical typology has to do with the price of salvation. The price of salvation. Okay. Jesus was weighed with the price of a slave and of, and of a criminal. A ransom for himself. When Jesus was betrayed for the silver, he gave a ransom for himself to the Lord. He ransomed us. Him for us. When you number them, there shall be no plague among them when you number them, the rest are under a plague. A census is a deep thing in Scripture. We have a teaching called the Second Sin of David, an old teaching, but it's still available on the website. If you're not familiar with it, I would urge you to listen to it. Okay. We all know about the first sin of David, his immorality with Bathsheba and what, what resulted from it. But his second sin was even worse. It had national consequences. 
He took a census. He numbered the people. He tried to build the kingdom according to his own plan instead of God's. You were only to number the people with God's instruction. Whose name is in the book of life? <laughs> Whenever the church has numbered the people, look out. Look out. When did David do it? Before he was going to build the temple. You see the second sin of David happening now. When these churches get into building programs, not ordained of God. Now, if God says build a Christian school, please build one. If he says build a Christian hospital, please build one. If he says build a church building, please build one. We just built one in India because the people couldn't fit in the homes. Too poor and too crowded. If God says build a church, build one. Build a school, build one. Build a missionary hospital, build one, please. But when people get into building monuments to themselves, when they're building their own empires instead of the kingdom of God, what do they got to do? Well, we got to get a mortgage. Well, we have to submit a financial report. We have to get our accountants. How many members do we have? Based on the last three or five years, how much tithing and offerings do we get? We have to show it as a business plan to get it. <laughs> they number the people. Number the it says in the book of Acts, the Lord added to their numbers. Now it gives the figures, 3,000 the first day and so on. It gives the figures. But God added those, not people. Today the church has become saturated and emaciated with church growth programs that came from Peter Wagner, from Fuller Seminary, from Robert Schuller, from Bill Hybels, but they didn't come from the Word of God. Remember, lest the Lord builds a house, it cannot stand. Oh, you can build it. But what's become of the first one, their flagship? What happened to the Crystal Cathedral? When I used to drive by that place on the on the 405 freeway, I used to, I used to pray that God would send an angel with a slingshot. That place collapsed 154 million in debt. What became of, of, of any of these joints? What became of Jim Baker's P, the PTL club and his Heritage USA? What became of it? What became of Willow Creek? What, what becomes of these joints? What became of that Mars thing with the, 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 that guy up in Seattle? What was his name? The, the, Mark Driscoll. <coughs> what becomes of these joints? <coughs> Unless the Lord builds the house, the labors labor in vain. Oh, you can number the people. They get church growth programs based on marketing, find out what the people want and give it to them and build up the numbers of the church. And <coughs> they're building the empires of men, not the kingdom of God. A faithful preacher would rather preach the truth to 20 people than preach a mixture of truth and error to 20,000. <coughs> Remember, at the very end of the day, after three and a half years of ministry, even though thousands came and listened to him, what was Jesus <coughs> left with? As far as we can tell from the New Testament, Around 500. Around 500. Not 500,000. 500. 500. <laughs> when they number the people. Okay. Be very careful. Now, we're not saying, well, we've got to comply with the fire law regulations. We're not saying we have to know how many seats to put out. We're not saying the practicality should be ignored. But we are saying church growth must come from the one who gives the growth. It cannot come from the schemes and devices of man. It must come from the Spirit of God, the preaching of the gospel, and not the making of members or converts, but of disciples. I've seen this. 
I've seen good churches ruined by this. I had a friend, I didn't know him that well, but he was a friend, and I knew him, a Jewish guy, Lonnie Solomon. Nice guy. The Lord blessed his ministry. He was the pastor of the church in McLean, Virginia. A lot of Pentagon people, CIA people, people, you know, from K Street, and, you know, the lobby lobbyists and things like a lot of people like that went to the church a lot of christians and it was a big big church what happened once david platt got hold of it we had martin lloyd jones church in london what happened when paul kane's partner rt kendall got a hold of it now the same thing has happened to Times Square Church in New York City. Women pastors and all of this bringing in crazy people. Once David Wilkerson was gone, that place died. People become infatuated with numbers. Now when God gives growth, praise God. I have seen unbelievable growth in the Jesus movement. Some of them were all right. Calvary chapels, the hippies. But I got saved and they're children of God. You want to talk about growth and numbers? You wouldn't believe it. How many hippies were getting saved? Then there was the Church of Bible Understanding, the Forever Family. You wouldn't believe the growth. Where are they now? Dead cults. A handful of lunatics spiritually deluded terrible and the numbers it became about numbers i remember Stuart trail the leader of the kobu cult when he went off one of the things he did was he got into the numbers game and boy did he get into it but the lord didn't build the house and it didn't stand and always took on a financial dimension Notice it links it with the silver. Now, the Hebrew word for money is silver, kesef. How much money do you have? I've said this before. Kama kesef, yesh lecha. How much money do you have? It's the same as how much silver do you have. Yesh lecha kesef, do you have money? Yesh lecha kesef, do you have silver? <laughs> the money and the silver go together. When you see growth, be careful. Slow, steady, qualitative growth, getting a right doctrinal foundation is always more important than maverick growth where there's not a good foundation. The numbering of the people and the money go together. You've got to, when, I'm telling when a church is struggling, it has, to, it has to seek the Lord, but at least it knows it. When a church is growing and booming and blossoming, you wind up with the Rick Warren thing. Throw Jesus in the back seat. Matter of fact, throw him in the trunk. We don't need the Bible. We have the purpose-driven lie. That's what happens. This is what everyone whose number shall give. A half shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 gadas. Half the shekel is a contribution to the Lord. Now, it's not our subject today, but there are other places where the Bible says, the rich shall not pay more, the poor shall not pay less. Graduated taxation. If you want to say everyone has to give a certain percentage, Okay, a rich person's percentage is going to be more money than a poor person's percentage, but it's a fixed percentage. Once you begin to finagle with this, even in the secular realm, and I'm not trying to be political here, but once you begin with graduated taxation percentages and not making the same for everybody, I'm not saying the same amount, but certainly the same rate of taxation, what happens? <laughs> You've got corporations going offshore, hiring high-powered tax accountants and tax lawyers, international tax lawyers, 
and they're engaging in what amounts to legal mon legalized money laundering because they have the money and the power to do it. And the middle class gets shafted. If we stick to biblical principles, if, if our laws are based on biblical principles, there's going to be a lot, lot less legalized corruption. And remember, there's as much legalized corruption as there is illegal corruption. So many of the laws you see in, 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 in countries, including the United States, it's just legalized corruption. It is just legalized corruption. There was a born-again Christian professed senator. He was known as the leading evangelical in the U.S. Senate. His wife was from a tobacco dynasty in the American South. And he was the chairman of the Senate Oversight Committee for subsidies, responsible for subsidies <laughs> to the tobacco industry. On one hand, the government was paying for TV ads, telling people not to smoke and the danger of cancer and heart disease and things like this. And the American Medical Association was at war with the tobacco lobby, and it was tons and tons of money and lawsuits and everything. At the same time, the American taxpayer was subsidizing the growth of tobacco. <laughs> you're subsidizing something, you're telling people are going to get cancer from smoking and it. And you got a Christian on this and the Senate committee overseeing. This is a Christian. Oh boy. How do you get such irrationality but legalize corruption? When we deviate from God's principles, you're going to wind up with corruption. And you're going to wind up with something that makes no sense. The rich shall not pay more. The poor shall not pay less. Now, there were votive offerings. People could give more charitably. Obviously, if somebody makes 100000 a year and they pay 10% of the taxes and somebody makes a million a year, <laughs> the guy making a million is going to pay as much taxes as the other guy earns. Okay, but they're both paying 10%. Standardized fees. It should be the same. Something should be the same price for everybody. Now, I accept the fact that you can have like widow's benefits and you can have things like PXs in the military. There's things that are subsidized. To, to make things more affordable for military families with guys serving in Germany or something like that where the dollar against the mark might or the, 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 the euro might not be a good exchange rate. So they buy it at the PX and it, it's so... I'm not saying there's not a place for that. But God's standard or God's philosophy is equitable equitable it's the same standard for everybody jesus talked about this in matthew 23 you bind heavy burdens hard to bear but you won't lift them with one finger just think of the catholic church in ireland catholic priests telling catholic families it's a sin to practice birth control he doesn't have to worry. He just goes over to the convent when he gets interested and aroused and finds a little nun. And if he gets her pregnant, he just kill the kid and bury him out in the back of the convent after you sprinkle him. They did this. They did this for generations. They finally got caught. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear, but they don't lift them with one finger. Equitability is the same for everybody. Well, let's look.
everyone who is numbered from 20 years old in verse 14, they all give the half shekel. Everyone who is numbered from 20 years old and over shall give contribution to the Lord. At various times in history, the age of adulthood varied. At one time, they made, it was 21. You couldn't vote unless you were 21. And then people said, well, you got guys going to Vietnam 17 and 18, old enough to die, they're old enough to vote. How can you do this and draft them and send them to a war when they can't vote? It's not fair. Then they reduced the voting age to 18. Not for people in the military, for everybody. <laughs> I wouldn't care if they did it for people who were in the military. I think it's right to say if somebody's in the military and they're 18, they should be able to vote. But then they say, oh, the age of drinking is 20. <laughs> you can't drink in America unless you're 20. England's different. Wait a minute. I can go to Iraq, <laughs> but I can't have a beer. <laughs> is it 18, 20, 21? In Israel, God said it was 20. That was the age, 20. Somebody would not go to the military to war till they were 20. There were no 18-year-olds. They were 20. That was the age. It was 20. And if you got married, to make sure you had a son to look after your wife in her old age, that was your pension, and to perpetuate the Yerusha, the inheritance, you had a year off. You had a year off with non-military service to try to conceive a son. God said it was 20. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong if it's not 20. I'm just saying that in the Bible, that age was 20. That it, There were two ages that were significant. Bar Mitzvah age, which was 12, 13, and the other was 20. Those were the ages. The third being 30. The third being 30. That was the age of what we might call, and I use the term sparingly, for one of a better one, adult maturity. David began to reign as king when he was 30. Jesus began his ministry when he was 30. So you had 12, 13. Jesus was bar mitzvahed at that age when he was with the wise men in the temple. And then you had the age of 20. Then you had the age of 30. Then there was the retirement age for the Levites. The Levites retired at the age of 50. But of course, that had to do with the longevity of the time. People live to be older now. Okay. That was based on the longevity of the time was low, less than it is now for most most people. Okay, the retirement age that can be more flexible, but the age of 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 manhood and being responsible for keeping the law, the Torah, that was fixed. The age of military service and adulthood that was fixed. The age of adult maturity, knowing what you should do, what you should be. By the age of third, that was that was fixed. If somebody grew up in a Christian home and they don't know what God's calling them to do by the age of thirty, they got a problem. Everyone who's numbered from twenty years old and over shall give the contribution. The rich shall not pay more; the poor shall not pay less. The half shekel, when you give the contribution to the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. Notice the silver is for atonement. <clears throat> Jesus was betrayed for silver, the price of redemption. He was valued at the price of a criminal. The rich shall not pay, of and a slave. The rich shall not pay less. Of the rich, the, the rich shall not pay more. The poor shall not pay less. His blood co-equally avails for everybody. Irrespective of socioeconomic status, we all need salvation. Remember, forget social gospels. Should we give a, a homeless person help if we can and a, and a hungry person help? Yes. 
But their biggest need is not being homeless or hungry. The biggest need of a poor person, even a homeless and hungry person, is salvation. The biggest need of a rich person is salvation. doesn't matter someone's socioeconomic status. No matter how wealthy they are, no matter how poor they are, the biggest need of the rich and the poor alike is salvation. Same. Rich shall not pay more, the poor shall not pay less. To make atonement for yourselves. You shall take the atonement money from the sons of Israel and give it for service of the tent of meeting, that is to the priest, that it may be a memorial for the sons of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. Contributing to the work of the Lord is an obligation for all of us. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall also make a laver of bronze. Now, bronze has to do with judgment, doesn't it? The choshet. It's not like silver, not like gold. With its base of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it. And Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water that they may not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up in smoke a fire sacrifice to the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet that they may not die. It's a perpetual statute for them for Aaron, the high priest, of course, and his descendants throughout their generations. Notice the washing ritual came first. Remember Jesus said, wash each other's feet. The rest of you was clean because of the word I spoke to you. It's only your feet. That anatomical member that comes in contact with the world. Our feet get soiled. We have to go to work every day. We have to deal with unsaved people. We have to go to the supermarket and the bank. We have to get caught up in the hustle and bustle. We live in a world governed by crooked politicians, most of us. We live in a world that defiles. We are in it, but not of it. We are clean because of the word, the gospel, the atonement. But our feet get soiled. Now the clergy, remember, the Levitical clergy, the priests. That applies to the Aaronic priesthood and to the Levites, Judeocentric. It has an application to those in full-time ministry today. But it's the priesthood of all believers. The Messiah would purify the priests of Levi. Before we can come to the altar, we have to come to the basin. Notice the progression. Bronze, Nehoshet. Silver, Kesef. Gold, Zahav. As you proceed towards the Holy Ark, the value of the metals increases. Bronze, silver, gold. The first thing we need to do before we burn any incense is clean our feet and hands. We handle the things of the world. We walk in a fallen world. Lord, I did this, I did that, I was thinking of this, I shouldn't have entertained those thoughts, those temptations, I shouldn't have lost my temper, I shouldn't have done this, I shouldn't have done that. We come to the lava basin, first of all. There must be a purification, a cleansing to wash our hands and our feet when we handle the things of the world things that are not necessarily wrong in themselves but the education system the health system the financial system anything we're handling the things of the world they're all tainted with sin we have to do it but you have to clean your hands before you come before the lord 
and we walk on a fallen world, we have to clean our feet. Then, then we can approach the altar. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water. Now, what is this? Well, one thing is Ephesians. Wash with the water of the word. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Christ washes the bride with the water of the word. Christ washes the bride with the water of the word. Scripture, among other functions, has a cleansing property. It has a cleansing property. Now, there are other aspects to it, but it has a cleansing property. I always tell people, just read the book of Proverbs and let the Holy Spirit show you all the stuff wrong in your life. That's for all of us. The water. Wash with the water of the word. They shall wash their hands and their feet that they may not die. If you try to serve the Lord with unclean hands and unclean feet, if you are not cleansed from your contact with the world, you're in danger. Now, we may not keel over and snuff it biologically, although that can happen. Happened to Ananias and Sapphira, or whatever. I'm not saying it can happen, but it can certainly, if not repented of, incur spiritual death. It shall be a perpetual statute for them, and it particularly applies to those in full time ministry, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. Well, we've been going over an hour. I think we will resume in verse 22 next week. Okay.